I've spent several years talking about video games in general, and it feels like I've finally covered everything when it comes to the medium. From the creation of a video game, to the release of a video game, and the nuclear fallout that happens immediately after once customers find out that the product that they've received is absolutely not the product that they were initially sold on. In almost each and every one of my videos, I've talked extensively about different video game genres and sometimes have made videos dedicated to games that I love. Or hate. And there was a point after I completed my last video where I sat back and thought that I had done absolutely everything. What more is there to cover? I haven't uploaded many videos and it already feels like I've covered everything I want to cover. Actually, that isn't true. I just had an extended break because I needed one and everyone was locked inside the houses for approximately six decades, give or take. But now I'm back. Anyway, I previously talked about using game engines such as Unity, Unreal, RPG Maker, and more in order to make your dream game. I'm not going to talk about it any further than I already have, but essentially the development pipeline follows the seven cycles of game development, also known as the seven cycles of hell. From planning the concept of the game to the launch, normally throughout this development cycle, you have to follow an extremely strict game plan and developers of AAA games have less freedom to do what they want and have to follow instructions by the scary project managers that can do almost anything to them on a whim. No bugs or glitches allowed by the end of this shift or else you'll be staying behind after work for about 13 extra weeks. What's that? You've got kids to feed? Well you should have thought about that before you programmed that if else statement and detonated your colleague's PC. After a long and tedious development cycle that probably has you delay the game over and over and over and over again, yellow background, the game would finally get launched launched and sent to stores. People would flock to their local blockbuster for the sole intention of <clears throat> borrowing the game and then never giving it back. Video games had that kind of novelty to them. An unfamiliar environment filled with things waiting for you to explore. And as a youngling, you'd play right into that novelty. You'd go home and turn on your rusty, cobweb-filled grey box that hasn't been touched for two and a half years. Oh, it's my PS5! My bad! How could I have made this dumb mistake? What a screw-up I am! You'd return home and turn on your console of choice to play the game that you've been waiting to play for ages and never mind there's a 140 gigabyte patch. Guess I'll see you next week. When you finally have the game up and running, you then get the opportunity to explore the game world that the game has offered to you. The best kind of games are the type of games that will interest you enough to explore it almost to its entirety as opposed to dropping the game within four minutes because the tutorial is that boring and you go back to play your old reliable game, which is obviously Max Dirtbike on MaxGames.com. As you play through the game, there may be very rare occasions in which you discover small things in the game that you were not supposed to find during regular gameplay. And now you've suddenly relocated to a place in Russia called Stancia Krasnoprinsnenskia, and your real name now has a bunch of numbers on it, and you're being hunted by agents working for Hideo Kojima because you typed the Konami code in a game that secretly disguises a government recruiting scheme. Where am I going with this? In most, if not all games, developers will hide things for the player to discover at any point, rewarding the player for looking into every nook and cranny that the game has to offer, or going through every possible scenario of a conflict in a game. Sometimes there's small callbacks to other games or media, and other times they are major gameplay changes that alter the entire layout of the game. And in super rare cases, said gameplay change could actually reveal an entirely new game that wasn't even shown from the beginning, and now you've managed to get two games for the price of one. This phenomenon is known in simple terms as easter eggs. Anyone who's ever played anything ever would obviously know what an easter egg is, as they're often synonymous with game development and any little secret in a video game can be classified as one. But for the 3.14% of people that somehow don't know what they entail, in simple terms, an easter egg is a hidden message, feature or image hidden in any form of medium to do with technology such as film, television or in this case, a video game. Because of the nature of video games in which you yourself would interact with everything, or almost everything that happens during gameplay, easter eggs are extremely common because game developers want to entice you to continue playing the game with the possibility of finding more secrets within. Think of it as a literal easter egg hunt. You're spawned in a field or a haystack or whatever kids play around in these days and your task is to simply find eggs hidden in the area. Sometimes the eggs are obvious and are placed within places that you can see from miles away and other ones require you to use a demonic summoning ritual to summon a succubus to give you a clue to find the next one. This game tends to happen over Easter, hence the Easter part of 
Easter egg. Now that we've got those unpleasantries out of the way, let's get back to how this relates to the video in question. Easter eggs have a very complicated history, especially within video games and software development in general. As while there's a clear documented history of when the term was coined, actual applications of Easter eggs have been a thing for a very long time, even before video games were created. This boils down to a fact that I mentioned earlier in the video, that Easter eggs can be a variety of forms and can be as small as a simple text box in Wingdings referencing something the developer or publisher finds funny, all the way to an entirely brand new game triggered by typing the correct combination to unlock a terminal in the middle of an empty city. And in this video, my aim is to delve into some of these easter eggs and talk about a couple that I specifically remember from my childhood, as well as some more well-known ones and some niche eggs as well. I won't be lying if I say that this video is definitely one of the most difficult videos I'm going to make due to how much information spam I'm going to give you in a relatively short amount of time. <coughs> <clears throat> and this is going to be slightly different from my regular form of content as there's just so many different types of easter eggs to cover. Also it's pretty obvious but it goes without saying that this video is going to contain a lot of spoilers for a lot of games. So if you really don't want to be spoiled on games that were released decades ago, please make a 360 turn and moonwalk out of the room now do it now okay now that they're gone let's start our deep dive into easter eggs in video games starting from the very very beginning. The year is 1980. The Rubik's Cube was released internationally and the world finally saw colours for the very first time. Pac-Man made his debut and introduced cutscenes to the gaming world for better and for worse. John Lennon became a major victim of stand culture and was deleted from existence. And post-it notes were created. A small indie company that went by the name of Atari had released a home console that went by the name of the Atari 2600, also known as the Atari VCS. This console was the dog's bollocks. At the time of release, this was the gold standard of video gaming at home. You wanted to play the latest and greatest games such as Pac-Man and Space Invaders? Well, the Atari 2600 was the way to go. The 1980s are probably the most influential period for video games, as a lot of tropes that were started in this era carried over to future generations, such as continuous background music introduced in Rally X. Yes, people actually played games that were completely dead silent the entire time, and they loved it. I'm honestly surprised that creepypastas didn't target this early era of gaming. The late 70s to early 80s also introduced the notion of multiplayer with the release of Firetruck. Well, multiplayer kind of already existed, but someone at Atari thought to themselves, what if instead of having people work against each other to beat each other, why don't we have them work together to complete the game? And the other executives at Atari definitely thought this was the best and most influential thing to be conceived since sliced bread. I felt that it's necessary to bring up just how influential the 80s were in introducing game mechanics that are still in use to this day before I delve into another influential addition to the video game development arsenal. So let's get right into it. Adventure is a video game released by Atari sometime in July 1980 for the Atari 2600, and it was developed by Warren Robinett. The game was pretty simple, as was the case for most Atari 2600 games, as they genuinely couldn't handle more than four pixels at any given moment, or else the console would cause a resonance cascade in your suburban neighborhood. In the game, you play as a square, and your job is to fetch an enchanted chalice that an evil magician has hidden somewhere around the kingdom. On the way though, you have to face a variety of different enemies with the intention of hindering your progress. There are three dragons in the kingdom, and each of them do very different things with relation to the player. Yorgles the yellow dragon and guards the sacred chalice. Grundles the green dragon and guards a lot of places and items in the game. And Rindles the red dragon, and his job is to guard the white key and the chalice. Because of the graphical limitations of the Atari 2600, all of the dragons in the game look like ducks more than anything, and some of them are deathly afraid of the keys you collect somehow. As the main character, your job is to just cycle between each and every room that the game has to offer, collecting keys and escaping the three castles in the story, each of them containing catacombs and mazes that you have to solve in order to get more clues that will help you find the sacred chalice that the evil magician has hidden. The game had three levels to it, each with varying degrees of difficulty, with level one being the absolute easiest to complete. It didn't include the bat that only exists to bless your day or ruin it by stealing your only item and potentially replacing it with a whole ass enemy. It didn't include the white castle. It didn't have any of the invisible mazes. 
It didn't even have Rendell. Level 1 can be seen as the demo of the game, containing absolutely nothing even for Atari 2600 standards, and only really existed for people to get a taste of to what they could be missing out on. Or they found levels 2 and 3 to be too hard and wanted to be babied through the gameplay. <laughs> level 2 is essentially the full version of the game, containing all the features that I outlined before, and including new ones such as the notion of resurrecting your character if you end up dying in game. There was also another difficulty slider, this time on a hardware level. You could use the difficulty switches on the Atari 2600 to control the game's difficulty, with one switch controlling the bite speed of the dragons and another one controlling whether or not they get scared of the sword you carry throughout the game. I mean, I don't really see how that could be scary. It's just an arrow. Holy oh, shit! When Adventure was released to home systems, it exploded in popularity. It was considered the first action adventure and console fantasy game. And because of this, everyone flocked to the game with the intention of experiencing some adventure, with Atari selling more than a million cartridges of the game. The popularity of the game caused a lot of heads to turn, especially Warner Communications, more commonly known nowadays as Warner Media, who were the owners of Atari at the time. The executives saw how well Atari was doing with regards to video game sales and publicity, and decided to completely ruin the company image in a record amount of time. Now, where have I heard that one before? The suits across the country did not have the same mindset as the developers down at California, and because of that, they decided to remove any form of developer credit in all of their games for a variety of reasons. Nowadays, you have an entire team of developers on a AAA game regardless regardless of genre, and all of them are credited down to the person who probably made an off-handed tweet talking shit about the game five years before development even started or something. But back then, games were mostly developed in minuscule teams, and in Adventure's case, only one person who went by the name of Warren Rubinez. Because of this, the corporate higher-ups at Atari became just a little bit stingy and wanted to keep all of the developers from escaping their dungeon and going to other companies for salvation. The lack of credit in any Atari game was also done to prevent any developer from having any form of bargaining chip against management. And it was because of these sentiments that almost all the original developers for games on the Atari 2600 left the company, and some of them splintered off to create another game company that would make games that would rival Atari and that company's name was Activision. Now, unbeknownst to literally anyone else, Robinette actually hid a secret inside Adventure that would stick the middle finger to the old heads of Atari. If you had a copy of Adventure, you had to first set the game difficulty to levels two or three. Then you need to do the olden days version of boundary breaking by retrieving a singular pixel object from the Black Castle. After doing that, you need to bring that dot along with some other objects to a corridor below the Golden Castle, which causes some sprite flickering. Normally you'd pass this off as a simple glitch, but if you kept going through the flickering wall, you'll reach a secret room and then <gasps> What well, secret room credit the developer of the game? Oh my god, the manager's gonna be angry about this one, sonny! Yep. A secret room that isn't mentioned in the game or absolutely anywhere that goes against corporate orders and rightfully credits Robinette for his game. The origin story doesn't end there, as Robinette didn't tell anyone about the secret for over a year. No one knew about the secret, not even any of his friends at Atari, and it managed to make it past all the tests before release without anyone clocking it at all. It took a random 15 year old from Utah to find the supposed glitch and snitch on Robinette, prompting Atari to launch an investigation into locating and fixing it. After all of this kerfuffle, Atari decided to just say sod it and leave the glitch in game, and dubbed the hidden feature an easter egg. Atari would then make its official company policy that every future game released by them would contain easter eggs, that would give hardcore gamers more of an incentive to look into every nook and cranny that the games will offer. And from that, the easter egg was born. But what if I told you that this actually isn't the first Easter egg in video games? Wait, what? You spent this long talking about the game and it wasn't even the first one? Well, it was the first video game Easter egg to be called that, but the actual first Easter egg in video games was discovered in 2017 in the game Starship 1, also released by Atari. This Easter egg involves a secret message popping up on screen and the player getting rewarded 10 extra lives. While this does count as an Easter egg, I felt it more prudent to include the adventure one as the legacy of the game has had a huge effect on the games industry that can still be felt to, to this, this day. day. Atari would continue to make video games that would capture the masses. Then Karma finally served them for treating their developers poorly and they made a string of terrible financial decisions leading to them self-destructing and taken the entire gaming industry with it. Now the groundworks for Easter eggs had been set in stone, this provided an outlet for game developers to hide things in their games, and this trend would continue all the way into the noughties. Easter eggs became a mainstay in video game culture after the release of Adventure, and most of the time, they are entirely intentional. The Easter eggs are put in place by the developers so that one lucky person could play the game and notice something amiss with the in-game environment, and write an angry letter to the ASA complaining that the game isn't running as advertised. These eggs were made as a way 
for the developer to bridge the gap from the game to the player and a lot of easter eggs especially in the modern era rely on the concept of fourth wall breaking in order for them to work as well as they do because of this you may see a lot of crossover between my fourth wall breaking video which you can watch in the top right corner of the screen and this one however not all easter eggs are intentional and sometimes they can originate from a total cock up in the development cycle the most well known victim of this is of course the konami code Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A. Most people would have heard of this code, and if you haven't, I would like to buy six copies of the Rock You Are Living Under stat. The Konami code is a cheat code that is synonymous with the gaming community, but its most well-known operation is in games developed by Konami obviously. While Konami nowadays is a shadow of its former self and overworks their developers to hell and back to create masterpieces such as <laughs> Back in the day, Konami were an absolute powerhouse in console gaming, housing many titles within the company that were seen as household names such as Metal Gear, Contra, Castlevania, DDR, and Silent Hill. Kind of funny that all of the franchises there are all dead. But the first inclusion of the Konami code comes from a series I'm sure they've forgotten called Gradius. Gradius was released in 1985 as an arcade game, then re-released in 1986 for the NES. The game was pretty simple. You are a spaceship and you have to guide your ship in a side-scrolling shooter to destroy some other ships, and then towards the end you have to destroy some big ships while upgrading your own ship with weapons that will completely rinse the other ships. Did you get all that? Good! The upgrades in the game were slowly given to you the more you play, but the developer of the game, Kazuhisa Hashimoto, wanted to be able to allow himself to debug the game to fix anything if needed, and he programmed in the code to do this. The Konami code in this game basically made you godlike, giving you additional health and power-ups instantly so you can get through the game as fast as possible. This is all well and good, but normally you're supposed to kind of remove these codes before the game is shipped to arcades and consoles. However, Hashimoto kind of forgot to do that, so the code was kept in the game and sure enough some players found out about it but instead of going ballistic and calling for konami's head like the world is so used to nowadays people just ran with it some people just have that kind of morbid curiosity about them and just want to be able to see what happens when you load your character with the most ridiculous weapons just to kill a singular anime girl zombie or something this kind of thing also leads into video game cheats but there are other videos on the site that talk about this in a little bit more detail wink wink nudge nudge the popularity of the konami code inspired konami to then use it for a lot of their games moving forward. For example, Metal Gear Solid 2 has a ton of fourth wall breaking moments that can make its own video. But if you type in the Konami code when prompted for a clear code at the end of the plant chapter, Snake will do this. What do you think you're doing? This easter egg is kept in the substance version of the game, but there is another point in which you can use the Konami code. In the missions mode of the game, you are prompted to choose a username, and setting your username as the first letters of each item in the Konami code, which will make your name look like your Google Assistant's attempting to translate baby speak, will give you the option to unlock every character in every stage in the game. Similarly, in Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, if you type the Konami code in the title screen, not only will Raiden say the title of the game confirming that you got the code right, but you will also unlock two more difficulty settings in the game and every mission as well. Horror games weren't even safe from this, as in Silent Hill 3, if you beat the game at least once and then type in the Konami code in the title screen, Douglas will decide that he won't be needing clothes anymore as he will show up in his underwear in each cutscene. The Konami code became such a major part in gaming history that games that weren't even published or developed by Konami would use it for their own easter eggs in their games. And somehow Konami didn't use their army of anti-PT lawyers to shoot them down on site and KILL THEM ALL! Rocket League is one of my favourite pastime games of all time. It literally is my most played game on Steam. But a lot of new players may not know that Rocket League is actually a sequel to a game released on the PS3 called Sart BC or Supersonic Acrobatic Rocket Power Battle Cars. Yeah, not surprising they changed the name. In the main game, there are some homages to the original car footy game, but there's a hidden one before the game even initializes. By typing the Konami code on the splash screen, instead of the normal Rocket League menu soundtrack and logo, the game will switch the branding to Sart BC, complete with the theme song and the original logo. When 
In a nice callback to the original Gradius game, Dead by Daylight also has a Konami code easter egg in the game. If you have any of the Silent Hill characters in the main menu of the game, typing the Konami code will play a song from Gradius and give you a charm that you could use on any of the characters. Personally, I think that's a pretty nice touch from the devs, which is the least they can do when the entirety of the game's update history consists of them fist f In a similar vein to the Konami code, Nier Automata contains a code that will take you all the way to the ending and it can be activated on the very first boss level. Lance McDonald discovered an insane easter egg in which if you put a specific combination at a very specific point after the first boss, you can skip absolutely everything in the game. And Yoko Taro confirmed that this is the final secret in Neo Automata and it hadn't been discovered for almost four whole years. Now I don't want to stray too far away from video games, but the Konami code is so goddamn popular that you have tech corporations using it for their own products as well, with Google, Alexa and Siri all having their own responses to telling them the Konami code verbally. It just goes to show how big easter eggs have gotten and to think this all started from a colossal cock up on Konami's part, which makes me hope that they do it more and accidentally put PT back on the PlayStation stores. Throughout the noughties and the 2010s, easter eggs were a mainstay in video game culture and turned plucky young gamers at the time into super sleuths, looking to find some secrets in video games so that they could Clara. brag to their schoolmates the very next day, and then brag to YouTube and receive some epic 5 stars and some reply girl video comments. Most games were there to reward you for finding big or small secrets in the game such as Mirror's Edge. Mirror's Edge is a fun game with gorgeous graphics and gameplay, especially for a game released in 2008. And the main selling point of the game of course is the profession of the main character, Faith, who's very good at parkour. While the game has some fun free running sections where you're running from the ops who seem to choose between having Stormtrooper aim and having Vakban aiming as well as running like a pensioner even on an RTX card, the game also has some moments in which you're forced to pick up a gun and start blasting. Throughout the game, you may encounter some small rats that have infested the city. I mean, that's fine, that's cool, rats gotta do what a rat gotta do. But in chapter eight, you're suddenly given a sniper and are tasked with shooting a convoy. Across the building you're in is another one that has a couple of dots in a pack. Pattern. If you shoot the convoy but then shoot at a specific dot immediately after, you get greeted with this lovely easter egg. Humor like that is a very big trope in a lot of these easter eggs, as they want to reward you for finding the easter egg, not report you to your parents for snooping in the game files too much. Doom is a franchise that's absolutely filled to the brim with easter eggs that are made to either get a rise out of you, make you laugh, or quite literally blow your mind. The whole franchise heavily rewards you on playing through the game and checking through as many things as possible, especially the newer games in the franchise, but one of the most famous easter eggs in Doom occurs in Doom 2 released in 1994, wherein the icon of Sim map, you are transported into a massive room containing the head of the icon of sin. While you're playing through this level, you will hear some weird garbled text that would assist the unnerving atmosphere of the game thus far. However, if you were to reverse the audio, you will find that you can actually understand the garbled voice as it says this. To win the game, you must kill me, John before you do anything irrational, the game doesn't give you any tips for this, but in that same level, you will find that behind the icon of sin, you will find John Romero's severed head on a stick. But how do you even get there? Well, the game also doesn't tell you this, but the only way to get into that area is to activate one of the many cheats in the game, specifically the noclip cheat, to access the closed area and shoot the head, which will indeed complete the game. This doesn't even scratch the surface of easter eggs in the Doom franchise, as the 2016 reboot of Doom has many easter eggs, including air areas in the game where you need to specifically find an area in the level that will activate a hidden room that looks just like the original game, complete with the scuffed monster animations and the crappy lighting. And even dying in the level gets you a quick little humorous easter egg as a callback to their old games. I don't want to go too much into specifics of all games or else we will be here forever, but another cool easter egg in Doom 2016 can be seen in the soundtrack of the game composed by Mick Gordon. Now we all know what the soundtrack sounds like, but if you were to open the songs in the soundtrack on an audio editing software and look specifically at the spectrogram, you will be able to see that Mick Gordon himself hid a couple of hellish references to the game in the spectrogram.
How would you even think to check this on a regular day? Now, most of these types of Easter eggs I've mentioned so far have been on a smaller scale, like a callback to a previous game or something slightly changing with regards to gameplay. But sometimes game developers hide entire games inside an already existing game that you could play yourself. Before you start frothing at the mouth and worrying about how many hard drives you're going to have to blitz through in order to try out some of these Easter eggs in question, the first and biggest barrier is the fact that these types of Easter eggs were mainly prevalent in the sixth generation of video games or older mainly owing to the fact that back then games were small enough to actually fit on a disc i know ghastly proposition am i right because of the small file sizes of a lot of these games especially the ps1 era you could get away with hiding games within a game and no one will ever know one example of this is the crash bandicoot franchise now a lot of people have very strong opinions on the franchise in general some games were good and all the other games just did not exist whatsoever but one polarizing game in the franchise goes by the name of crash bash which was Crash's answer to Mario Party. While the quality of the game is debatable, one thing everyone agreed on is just how long it takes to unlock everything in the game. If I was tasked with unlocking everything in the game just to play with friends, then you'd probably never see me again. So an Easter egg was discovered that essentially allows you to skip through all of the trouble of playing through the game over and over and over again. The only issue is that the Easter egg actually wasn't in Crash Bash itself. Now Spyro the Dragon and Crash Bandicoot have a weird relationship with each other. Don't take that the wrong way. As they were two of Sony's biggest mascots at the time. As such, in every single Spyro game, there were references to Crash Bandicoot, especially in the menus of all of the games. To find this Easter egg, you had to hold down a specific combination in the main menu to access a hidden demo of Crash Bash, which is all well and good. But then if you typed in another combination, you get access to the entire game, including cheat menus, maps, and more. An entire unfinished build of a Crash Bandicoot game managed to fit on a Spyro disc. You never see that kind of thing happen because games nowadays dedicate 80 gigabytes just so you can see all the detailed sweat particles and foliage in uncompressed PNG files. But this kind of Easter egg was very common back in the day. There are so many different Easter eggs in video games that it will be impossible to talk about all of them in a singular video. And while making this video and hunting for some Easter eggs myself, I realized exactly why some people pursue the art of Easter egg hunting as a career. But we are still not done and this is now the part of the video where i'm going to condense the evolution of video game easter eggs down to the genre of horror i'm sorry i'm sorry i had to do it eventually it's literally what i do since covering every easter egg known to man would be a ridiculous task best left to other channels this is the part of the video where i wanted to pivot the topic of the video back to the horror genre because as you'll soon find out easter eggs lend themselves to a lot of spooks especially surrounding video games and these creepy easter eggs span decades of content so get out of your chair or your bed go to the kitchen get some snacks come back to your room turn the lights off and on about five times to make sure that the demon in the room isn't there and relax as this part of the video is a doozy Easter eggs and horror are such a good fit that you could probably sell it on a second-hand store for a ridiculous markup. I've spent the entire video up until this point talking about how Easter eggs evolved with video games in general and how most Easter eggs in video games try to reward you for finding them. Sometimes though, video game developers hide things in their games that purely exist to give you a fright and potentially scar you for life for being too inquisitive. I covered some creepy Easter eggs a couple of years ago, namely the infamous Game Boy Camera Easter egg, but let me quickly jog your memory on this one as this is arguably one of the most famous creepy easter eggs in a video game released in 1998 the camera allowed you to take pictures and selfies that may look bad by today's standards what with our 300 megapixel iphone 25 cameras but i personally feel like the images that a game boy camera conjured up have their own charm to them until you try any of the mini games that the camera offered in some of the mini games there's an option to run and pressing that option would cause this to appear I want to know who took that photo and I also want to know who thought it was a good idea to have this in a device that was specifically marketed to children. The sound is incredibly jarring and harsh as well and would freak anyone out, accompanied by the ominous question that's been asked at the top of the error message. This would of course provide a lot of nightmare fuel, especially if you accidentally select the option somehow. And this all came from Nintendo. At this point, we shouldn't be surprised, especially when their flagship games include things like the Hell Valley Sky Trees seen in Super Mario Galaxy 2. If you enter first person mode in the Shiverburn Galaxy and look up into the background, you will be able to make out some strange figures at the 
the top of the mountain. You can never interact with them. They never move and they are not acknowledged by any of the characters at all throughout the duration of the game. It just seemed like a creepy Easter egg that Nintendo employees discussed to each other and employed to scar eight-year-olds for a new generation. And then Nintendo made it canon in the trailer for the new WarioWare game and also exposed to the world that these sky trees are absolute units. Oh my God. Dead space. <laughs> in a completely jarring and unrelated segue, Dead Space and its sequel came bundled with a ton of creepy easter eggs that require you to be a little more inquisitive in order to get. Now the game's atmosphere and aesthetic already led into a very creepy experience to begin with, but it's the environmental storytelling done by both games that also made the game so iconic, and the scares began before you even started the game. The menus in both games have easter eggs hidden within, with the first game having a creepy cutscene that plays if you spend too long looking for the any button on your keyboard or your controller filled with sudden jump scares to give your heart a little exercise stop it as well as that the game has something that i'd like to call an easter revelation something hidden in the game that spoils the events of the game if you haven't played it but you'll notice in retrospect if you've already played the game I don't know if that makes any sense, but there we go. In Dead Space, you are sent to respond to a distress signal from another ship, and you play as Isaac, who is but a lowly engineer who likes to step on a lot of things. Isaac's wife is on this ship and goes by the name of Nicole, and the game is split into chapters, which all have unique names about them. If you were to complete the game, you will already know the revelation that Nicole was already dead by the time you got there, and the chapter titles will reflect that, as the first letter of each chapter spells out the term, Nicole is dead. What? In Dead Space 2, they up the ante by having hidden Easter eggs in the menu of the game. You could use your right analog stick to look around the menu, and you will see some weird messages around the menu written in another language that you decipher in the game. When they are deciphered, you get some ominous statements talking about your fate in the game. This doesn't even scratch the surface of the kinds of Easter eggs you could get in both Dead Space games, and I do highly recommend you play them at least once just as long as you get past the weird mouse controls. The Grand Theft Auto franchise is no stranger to Easter eggs in general. Every single one of the games has their fair share of Easter eggs, as the world that's presented to the player is so vast and there are so many areas for the player character to explore, especially the older games such as San Andreas and GTA 4. Sometimes the Easter eggs are small references to Rockstar games and the callback to the time when they actually released more than one game a decade, and sometimes they are just notes to the player to stop investigating areas so much looking for Easter eggs. In San Andreas, if you equip a jetpack and go all the way to the top of Gant Bridge, there's an easter egg that basically contradicts itself saying that there are no easter eggs in the area. One of the creepiest easter eggs in the franchise however comes from GTA 4. In GTA 4 there's a statue that looks like the Statue of Liberty, but instead of Liberty, it's happiness instead. And the statue itself sports a very familiar face. <laughs> You can only reach the statue by swimming, taking a boat, or flying a helicopter there. Once you reach the base of the statue, you will find a slightly ominous sign that says that there's absolutely no hidden content this way. So of course there's hidden content that way. You go past the sign and eventually make it inside the statue, only to be greeted by this. That's cool and good. I, I love this kind of things in my video game. A round of applause for video games, everybody. This just goes to show how much information that developers can hide in any old game or software, and no one can ever find that it even existed to this day. It's insane that the source... I wanted to dedicate an entire section of this video just to the games developed using the source engine and the many easter eggs that come with them. This is completely different to what I usually do as normally I'd include this kind of thing throughout the video, but the sheer volume of creepy and funny easter eggs that I've gone through while playing source games and even random user generated maps in Garage Mod is enough to warrant its own part. Source is a game engine developed by Valve and it was released 17 years ago and to this day is one of the most iconic game engines there is. There are a lot of videos that have already been made about the somewhat creepy nature of the source engine, but a lot of the games have utilized this in order to conjure up some creepy experiences. For example, Portal 2 is just a simple puzzle game, right? Run! 
While the typical game has you control Chell as you navigate across several test chambers in the early game while completely missing the point of the game, which is not to trust British people, there is a specific chapter in which you can uncover a creepy Easter egg if you pay close attention to the background. In chapter three of the game, there's a secret passageway that will lead you into a room full of creepy writings on the wall and a lot of mugs on the floor. These are more commonly known as dens, and they were inhabited by a man named Doug Ratman, who was a scientist at the Aperture Science Enrichment Center, who was the only survivor of GLaDOS before the advent of the first game and is a paranoid schizophrenic who is dependent on medication as a means of keeping him sane in this world. You will see Ratman's dens throughout Portal and Portal 2 hidden throughout the games and often depict an unsettling imagery of things that he's been hallucinating or his experience of being the last survivor of GLaDOS. The sound design in this specific den is also unnerving as if you lean in close to the walls where all the writing is, you may hear whispers and the like. The Half-Life games also utilize the creepy nature of the sources and engine by constantly making you, the player, feel like you're being watched at all times. And in most cases, you are. Hidden around the game, the G-Man is watching you, and if you notice him, he will simply just turn and walk away. Again, I don't want to go too much into detail about every single Easter egg ever, but there's a game that I wanted to talk about that has many of them and has evolved over the years of video gaming. And that game is Gary's Mod. Yes, Gary's Mod has several Easter eggs owing to the fact that anyone can make anything for the game, as evidenced by the Steam Workshop for the game, which has lots and lots and lots of items. Some good, most of them are bad. But there are some maps that literally everyone who has the game has probably heard of or played once. And all of them have several Easter eggs about them that heighten the creepy feeling of the Source engine. Personally, I think that these environments are comfy, but I can understand why people see them as unnerving, such as the ambience in GM Big City, making you feel like you're not alone, even though you're the only one in the map. Scattered around Big City are many Easter eggs. As the world is so big, it allows for you to explore to your heart's desire. For example, at the corner of the map, there is an area that contains a building that looks like a coffee shop. If you go to that building and try and open the doors, the game punishes you with an obnoxiously loud jump scare. <laughs> Similarly, in the map, there are several dark alleyways you can go to that contain some creepy graffiti and writings, and interacting with a specific door will get you this pleasant noise. <laughs> Or how about the hidden room in GM Construct, another iconic Gary's Mod map, in which you can only enter the room if you find the right spot or you know clip there. The room is extremely dark, but it's a good way to hide the credits for the map, similar to the way Robinet did when he developed Adventure. And finally, there's another map that a lot of people may or may not know called GM Golden City. That world has many Easter eggs, but the weirdest one I found was the button Easter egg. I went to a specific basketball court on the map and scored a couple of buskets with a watermelon. After doing that, a noise that sounds like something being activated will occur. Going across the road led me to an open garage door that definitely wasn't open before. And after I went in the garage door, I was greeted with a red room, not the creepypasta kind, that had lots of graffiti and only one button. Pressing that button and absolutely nothing happens until I went outside and looked up at the sky and got the biggest heart attack of my life. Huh? All of these Easter eggs just prove how expansive this mechanic is and how much mileage you can get out of a simple secret in any old video game. And it's absolutely insane just how much there is to cover as more and more devs utilize this mechanic to hide entire ARGs into their games. And to think this all started with a hidden secret that someone slipped into their game because of a corporate cock up. Thank you Atari for blessing us with this core mechanic. Thank you Konami for spreading it across the entire gaming landscape. Still don't like you guys, but sometimes you're right. And thank you so much for watching this video. I know I have to address the big fat elephants in the room, so I guess I'll just use this time to talk about it now. I know by this time you are tired of me talking about my bad upload schedule on my main channel, and all I can really do is apologize. A lot of things have happened this year that's affected my mental state and the way that I work, and I do honestly wish I could get more videos out, but videos on this channel are very hard to make as I am the only one that makes them. Because of this, I'm very much appreciative of everyone that comes to watch my videos when they're released. This video is something I wanted to talk about, but didn't know how to go about it for ages, and I've been working on this ever since the corpse party video i would like to thank my patrons for letting me do this stuff full time and i'd also like to thank you guys for staying patient and following me on all my other social networks where i update you on this stuff if you guys don't already know i have a second channel where i upload much more frequently where i play all the games that i talk about in these videos as well as some extra ones every single week go check it out i'm sure there's a video for you there
Just be prepared for some more chaos compared to this channel. The videos that I make on that channel are edited down from streams that I do over on my Twitch, which will also be linked in the description. So if you're wondering where I am or why I haven't uploaded, go onto my Twitch and shout at me for not working on the script to my next video or something. Since my last video, I crossed 300,000 subscribers on this channel. That's a number I'm still not ever going to get used to. And I'm so incredibly grateful that you guys stay to binge my content and watch videos of me talking smack about things I like about video games, even though sometimes it may seem like I don't like them. What else is there to talk about? Oh yeah, merchandise. I have brand new merchandise that's arriving soon and it's something that I've been working on for over two years. The description will be updated as soon as the launch is out so you guys can get yourself things like hoodies, masks, sweatshirts and more. As well as that, I've said it before, but you can catch scripts and more behind the scenes footage as well as extended cuts and producer credits all on my Patreon. This will give you perks which you can use on my Discord server where I'm very active and talk to my Twitch subscribers and patrons about new videos and progress I'm making on each and every one of them. I feel like I'm rambling at this point so let's wrap things up and get out of here. Subscribe to all three of my channels. If you miss me on one, I'm probably alive on the other two. I'll try my absolute hardest to get past all of the stress and get you some more content to enjoy down the line. If you're on my Patreon, you can see the stuff that I'll be working on next. So again, check that out if you haven't already. Special thanks to Bailey, Dag, Boo Boo Kazoo, Captain Gur, Kaifa, Datura, Spikey, Nighttide Draco, Mega Nature, Mark Xiao, Luna, Josh Curbs, Heck, Ramsey, Zytonic, Xylanet, Vampire, Flower Crown, Splite, Seath Rujan, Joel M, Spooky Taylor, and the forthcomer for pledging with the Ascended Pledge. Now, if you'll excuse me, I think it's time to sleep again.